Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. The Jakarta Method by Vince Bevins, Washington's anti-communist crusade and the mass murder program that shaped our world is the undertitle published by Public Affairs New York. How come, with all what is going on today in the world, the American presidency to the situation of opening Israel with the Qatar and other Gulf Emirates, eventually Arabia, the situation in Iran, the complications in uh, Turkey, in Libya, uh, the power of Russia there, what's going on between America and China at the moment. I mean, all these many issues of foreign politics, including the bilateral relationships between Europe and the um, United States, Why did you decide to publish a book, which is a very remarkable book, on the whole, shall we call it, post-colonial situation of the world? And you take as two examples, Brazil, 1964, and uh, Indonesia, 1965. One was uh, different, was a smooth coup d'etat. The other one was a cruel coup d'etat, in which right-wing anti-communist governments have eliminated the communist infiltration, presence, uh, and eventual power that was uh, obviously disturbing the United States. And these two coups, if we want to call them like this, in your mind have changed the destiny of uh, the various and different alliances in the world. How come you publish this now? And then let's talk about your book. Sure, that's a very good question. I think there's two ways to answer it. The first way in the narrower sense, the narrower answer is that when I got to Indonesia in 2017 to cover Southeast Asia for the Washington Post, I realized that there was a story underneath everything else that I was supposed to be writing about. Wherever I looked in Indonesia and Southeast Asia as a whole, this story of the 1965 massacre of approximately 1 million uh, innocent civilians was lurking below the surface, but yet it was prohibited to speak about it. It was prohibited to actually tell the story. So just to sort of fulfill my role covering that part of the world, I thought that this needed to be addressed. And the fact that I found connections to South America, where I worked previously, where I knew the languages, made me believe that in the narrow sense, I could be a right per- the right person to cover this particular story, which lurked behind everything else happening in Indonesia in 2017. But in the larger sense, it ended up being a book about the nature of U.S. hegemony, right? A- about the ways that the United States exercised that hegemony in the epoch in which it was by far the most powerful country on the planet from 1945 until the present day. And I think that that second focus, that larger uh, story that uh, I end up telling with a much um, wider lens is relevant now because we're seeing U.S. hegemony in relative decline and contested, right? So under the administration of Donald Trump, it became more obvious than before that the United States was in relative com- decline compared to the peak of its power at the end of the 20th century, early 21st century. But even Without his particular antics, I think this is an important moment to examine what the real nature of U.S. hegemony was and the ways that it foreclosed certain developmental possibilities and generated other types of life on the planet. In the book, you explore two different things which are differently interesting and somehow linked. Taking Indonesia, for instance, which is the second largest Muslim country in the world, right? Yes, it's the the largest Muslim majority. The largest, yes. You start with the fact that Indonesia was um, a Dutch colony and uh, that uh, it was during the Second World War invaded by Japanese. And uh, there was a man, Sukarno, this... uh, odd architect, womanizer, uh, politician, manipulator, who somehow was very much against the colonial power of the Dutch vis-a-vis his country. 
and uh, fought as many other Indonesians that mm-hmm. the Japanese invasion would have been a vehicle for the independence from the Dutch. And therefore, when the Japanese lost the war, Sukarno proclaimed himself the father of the new country, somehow, the, the Indonesia. This didn't went very smoothly. I mean, it took several years of battles and different things before the Dutch really gave up. And uh, Sukarno created a country which was a mixture of three powers, if I am not wrong. The religious Muslim power, the military power, and then a party that was small at the beginning and grew bigger and bigger, which was the Communist Party, right? And he governed the country in an equilibrium between these three forces, right? So you are exploring that, but uh, Sukarno is ambiguous because he would like to make a sort of European Union in Asia with other Asian countries. He's very much helped by Pandit Nehru uh, from India in his politics. And they play across these two powers that are in Cold War at the time, which are Russia and the United States, and sometimes flirting with China, which is not yet the power that is today, but nevertheless a, a becoming power too. In the meanwhile, you describe the building up of the CIA, how how a strange wasp man, American man uh, with uh, excellent background and studies, put together this agency, right? And later on in the book, this is not only the story of Jakarta and Indonesia or Brazil or uh, Cuba or uh, Congo, Chile or the many countries you talk about, but it's also a story of the influence of the CIA with its good results and bad results, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it so? Isn't the fil rouge of this book the CIA? Is a V the different presidents and powers that have been in Washington over the years? I think that's right. I think that the protagonists in the book are the American foreign policy establishment and the members of the Indonesian left that believe they have a right to participate in the creation of a new world now that formal colonialism is over, that uh, direct European control over the global south has ended. And as you rightly point out, Indonesia was a hugely important part of the development of capitalism, right? Of the of, you know, the Dutch East Indies were a fundamental part of the early waves of globalization that took that took place in the era of uh, formal European control over much of, of Africa and Asia. And what happens in 1945 is that the United States emerges from World War II as by far the most powerful country uh, on the planet. The United States, however, does not have an agency like MI6 that the British Empire used that employed through various covert operations around the world to maintain its empire. The United States did not have a permanent intelligence agency or an overseas presence that would work behind the scenes to further American interests. So they threw threw together the the CIA very quickly. And I think that you're right to say that this group of men ends up being, they end up being so incredibly influential for shaping the post-war order that the book ends up ultimately being about the nature of U.S. power and the way that it that, had, that was exercised. You could have told the same story in a very inverse way. You could have made the story all about, for example, Suharto, the internal dynamics within Indonesia that led to the military to become so strong, um, his personal story, how it was that this dictatorship took place in Indonesia. But I think ultimately as an American, and for the reasons I, I described earlier, making American hegemony and the exercise of its power, the, uh, one of the main points of focus was the decision I thought best. But it's interesting because you say the, the CIA were men of good background, and that was true in the, in the narrow sense. In the narrow U.S. class system, they were blue bloods, right? They were from the best backgrounds that we had. But in another sense, they were very limited in their horizons, right? They were very American. They were very Protestant. They didn't know quite very much about Africa and Asia. They didn't really know very much about countries with religions different to theirs. And this became very apparent in the ways that they sort of threw their weight around in so many different countries. They were well-funded 
but quite inexperienced in what they were doing. And they were given a remit that had nothing to do with the welfare of the people in the countries that they were so aggressively intervening. What you do in your book, because, yes, Jakarta is a, a central issue to, because you describe in detail the upcoming of this revolution first and then of the way that um, Sukarno was running his affairs according to which president was the president of the USA, according to who was the head of of Russia. Uh, Khrushchev was different, obviously, from Stalin and what happened with other countries around. But then at the end of the day, you describe minutiously, like in a movie, the events that took place. Before I ask the next question, can you please very shortly tell me what happened? In 1965, the U.S.-backed Indonesian military oversaw the intentional execution of approximately 1 million innocent civilians and then created a dictatorship which became one of the most important allies for Washington in the Cold War. Yeah, but you're telling me something which is the official story. But the thesis of your book is that the Americans, the president himself, the White House and the CIA and other agencies worked behind all this, and uh, they created, invented a story that was plausible to their interest. They thought that this was built up by the communists in Indonesia who tried to kill some military people. Uh. So from 1955 to 1964, the United States, often with participation, had been trying to slow the growth of the Indonesian left, if not crush it. So they tried to bribe, they tried to funnel money to right-wing conservative parties, hoping that that would stop the communists from winning elections. It didn't work. In 1958, the CIA started bombing the country as part of a attempt to break up the country of Indonesia into little pieces. That didn't work. In the period that I think you're asking about, 1964 to 1965, there is still some mystery as to the exact mechanisms through which this clash was created, the, that was ultimately created by the September 30th movement, which was a group of military uh, officers that said they believed that there was a right-wing coup being brewed against Sukarno, kidnapped six generals who ended up dead at the bottom of a well. The details of who exactly planned the September 30th movement, for what purpose, why the generals ended up dead, if that was part of the plan, whose plan it was, all of this is very mysterious, and we're probably not going to know that until the CIA and the Indonesian military released all their classified files, we may never know. What we do know with certainty is that in 1964, the United States shifted its uh, tactics towards Indonesia. They switched out the ambassador who had been quite friendly with Sukarno. They brought in an ambassador that was widely seen as somebody who was sort of an expert in regime change. And we know from declassified files that the CIA and MI6, we were covertly agitating behind the scenes for a clash between the very well-armed Indonesian military and the entirely unarmed but popular Indonesian Communist Party. What you say ultimately in your book, where you rebuilt not only the creation of the CIA, but also president after president, uh, starting with Truman ending today, you go through Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and so on and so forth. And you touch all what happened, you know, in the foreign American politics uh, after the war, in the sense that ultimately, and the McCartney thing is the symbol of that that you described in the book also, was uh, this uh, deep anti-communism that comes after the war, because until the war they were allied with Stalin to win the war, but then they understood that Stalin wanted to take over as much as possible Europe, right? And uh, therefore becoming too powerful. And uh, the Americans uh, became uh, very, very strongly anti-communists, uh, to use a simple symbol. And uh, they found all the possible means to fight against it. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't succeed, president after president. 
But that's the ultimate goal, is to create allied nations, and they don't care about dictatorships or military coups or revolutions as far as the leaders become faithful to the American alliance. Yeah, I think there's a confluence, there is an overlapping of ideological and economic interests that are exercised. And as you rightly point out, anti-communism becomes a foundational guiding principle for U.S. foreign policy after World War II. So by 1948, I would say, um, by 1950, if you were not a fanatical anti-communist, if you were not 100% committed to the idea that communism must be battled across the world, you were not going to be in the United States government. Uh, Anybody that had any doubts about that were removed by 1950. And then by 1953, with the arrival of President Eisenhower and the first, quote-unquote, successful CIA operation in Iran. Successful operation in Iran means to bring back the Shah in Iran, right? To crush Iranian democracy and to bring back an autocrat who will make sure that Iranian economy is porous to international capital, specifically American uh, investment. And by 1953, it was no, no longer sufficient to be not allied with the socialist world simply failing to form an explicit alliance with the United States against the Soviet Union was enough to get you labeled as an enemy of the United States and a fair target for removal. So you had that in Iran in 1953, Guatemala in 1954. And then as I said, in 1955, they start trying this against Sukarno in Indonesia, but the first two attempts fail. Um, And the thing about being the CIA, the thing about being the covert operations team for the most powerful nation in history is when you screw up, you don't really get in trouble. There's no referee to stop you from trying again. And so what ultimately happened in 1965, this horrible massacre that is the the central event of the book, is really the third attempt through various means to to crush what they saw as a left-wing movement in Southeast Asia, which was incompatible with the world that they were trying to create. Nowadays compared to those days, because your book is is a a journalistic book, but it's very well documented, and it's like a kind of historical rebuilding of that time, right? You go from the killing of Lumumba in Congo to the Chilean revolution to what happens in, in Cuba with Castro and the Bay of Pigs and all these things with all the different presidents, right? But is it still the same today? No, it is not exactly the same. But what I will say is that one of the main points of the book, and this is is the reason to use this symbol, this phrase, this metonym, Jakarta, which you said, I think you used the word uh, pretext. It's not, a, it's not a pretext, but you're not exactly wrong. It is sort of, it is a powerful symbol that brings together. It's a powerful metonym that was employed uh, in real life. And the reason I thought it was so important is because it shows that the anti-communist movement the pro-American right-wing groups that were active in the 20th century, they were also an international movement just as much as the communists were an international movement, oftentimes more so. So over the Cold War, the United States and its associated uh, overt and covert agencies built up a toolbox of tactics, uh, strategies, stories that they understood worked in these kinds of operations. And they learned how to do things, they built up institutional capacity to uh, influence the world as effectively as possible. As the Soviet Union was attempting to do in different ways, they also were building up um, this knowledge of the world and how to affect it. The Soviet Union fell apart. The United States did not fall apart. All of the organizations that did these things exist more or less to do, doing these things that they were set up to do initially, right? So while you absolutely have to consider the way that the CIH changes after 1975, after the Church Commission, you know, uh, the CIA gets hauled before the Senate is forced to confess to all the most shocking things that is done, these stories still tell you a lot about the way that the United States maintained its power in the second half of the 20th century, the way that it shaped the world with its power, and the institutions that it has used to do so. And those institutions are still there, while all of the institutional armed communist parties, which were on the other side of that conflict are totally gone. KGB is still there for Putin, right? The KGB has been reborn as FSB and still has a bit of power. And today, Russia is not anymore the Soviet Union, but there is a new big power, which is China, right? And uh, 
it's uh, certainly not less dangerous vis-à-vis the West than Russia was. I can't believe that the United States, and we have seen it during the last presidencies, you know, that they, even the Europeans, you know, one way everybody wants to go to China to do business, but in the other way, everybody is fearing the project that China has. Mm-hmm. And they have already conquered very much ground in Africa, in Europe, and other countries. Not conquered, but yeah. I mean, they and have a that, strong absolutely foot into and, it. And China, I think, is on a path. You know, if things continue to go the way they're going, to end up being more powerful than the, the Soviet Union ever threatened to be. Right. So, so, so we really could be entering in you know twenty, forty, sixty, eighty years, a world of of Chinese hegemony. And by looking at the worst things that the United States did in the exercise of its hegemony by taking a very cold look at how the United States backed intentional mass murder of civilians in at least 20 countries to create the type of world that it wanted to create. I think we must be very careful to avoid the automatic assumption that some other power, any other power will always be better. Things could be worse than this. And it's absolutely true that just because the United States in the peak of its power in the late 20th century did horrible things does not mean that things will get better if those if the United States disappears off the face of the earth, right? So to understand, however, the ways in which the United States and China are likely to interact in the next 5, 10, 50 years as probably, I believe, there's some kind of a, a contestation of hegemony on the global scale, looking at what the United States did in the first Cold War, I think is very informative, but we should at the same time avoid assuming that it will be the exact same. Because as you point out, the financial systems are much more integrated, right? There's a lot of people in the United States and the US ruling class, if you want to use the old Marxist terminology, that have a lot to gain if, if the Chinese economy does well. So while we pay very close attention to the rise of this new and important power, I believe that looking at how the first Cold War was fought is fundamental to helping us decide how the West may want to confront, in quotes, a rising uh, power uh, with a population that is still far, far, far poorer than the average American or Western European. And I think it will help us to foresee the ways that this kind of conflict could go. Is the CIA still very powerful? It operates differently than it did then. The United States foreign policy apparatus is still incredibly powerful. If we combine the Pentagon with all of the various overt and covert operations that the United States carries out throughout the world, the United States is still by far the most powerful national security actor by far in the planet. Things have moved around a bit since 50s and 60s, but the United States is still far ahead of China when it comes to military power and the power to influence politically and economically less powerful countries. You are objective in your book, right? But you are objective in criticizing a system, right? Or more or less, not really criticizing, but showing it. You don't give a judgment, just look at facts. If you simply show, using well-documented facts, the ways that the United States fought the Cold War in the Global South, you don't need to make any judgment. There is a huge gap between, especially in the English-speaking world, the perception of what the Cold War was and what the United States actually did in pursuit of its Cold War uh, aims that I felt that I would, it would be entirely unproductive for me to jump in there and say, look, don't you think this bad? I think some parts of the story are so clearly bad that I let the I chose to let the facts speak for themselves. Yeah, but uh, as these empires as you said, two ways of reading history. I mean, it's not that Stalin has been a nice little boy, you know, who the exercise of power, and this is an historical fact, so over the centuries and the millennia, which is uh, often between one or two hegemonic empires, obviously implies violence, moments of conflict, and so on and so forth. Do you think that as a result, not as a methodology, the United States have been successful in their purpose to go against the communism and to keep 
some fundamental en enclaves around the world which are their allies, political allies? Yes, absolutely. I think it's really important that we understand the ways in which American victory was total and very deep as well. It was not just that. Sorry, yeah. I ask you this because Americans are very often criticized about not understanding other countries, not mm -hmm. understanding the Middle East, doing mistakes like Iraq, uh, things like that, because they don't uh, try to understand the locals and they think that more or less the rest of the world is like a Siri B America, right? It's like America yeah. a little less good. And they're very different from the colonial powers. In other words, the British colonies have still plenty of English rules and things, even if they are independent. I'm sure that in Indonesia there are still Dutch habits uh, and things like this, uh, or in French colonies. I mean, colonials left a culture. This it doesn't look like if America was interested in that. They may be interested in business. I think that's right to point out. I think that's absolutely right that the U.S., has a sort of deep-seated ideology. Some people have it worse than others. President Johnson had it worse than President Kennedy. To believe that the rest of the world is just like America, but not quite there yet. Like they're, they're going to be like us when they, when they sort of get everything together. And the, America is the only real country and all the other countries are going to be like us soon. Or if not, it's because they're lacking. And this is a, a deeply problematic part of American ideology. And I think it, would, it informed modernization theory, which I point to in the book as being such a disastrous force in the 20th century too, this idea that, all, well, you have to drag these quote unquote backward peoples through the difficult process to become more like us. And this is responsible for a lot of pain and suffering. So the question of whether or not this was a success is very interesting because there's two ways to look at it. On the one hand, if the goal was to create a prosperous happy, democratic Indonesia and Brazil and El Salvador, absolutely not, right? If the goal was to create little Americas, if the goal was actually to export democracy in our way of life, failure after failure after failure. If the goal was to maintain the United States at the top of a global capitalist order, which it profoundly shapes, which it oversees, and in which it is able to act economically on the vast majority of the planet, yes. So that is a very key difference, which I think, again, is Walton what the book's book is about, the difference between U.S.-led neocolonialism and the era of formal European colonialism. And this, there was a very interesting moment from maybe 1945 to 1955, when the leaders of the Third World Movement, the leaders of the Global South, as we call it now, weren't sure how this is quite going to go. They knew that the Americans were kind of like the Europeans but they didn't know if they were going to do quite exactly the same thing. If they were going to come in and maybe support independence, support the sovereign rights of black and brown peoples around the world to choose their own destiny, or if they were going to be sort of exactly the same. And the answer was not either of those things. It was to exercise a different kind of more narrow-minded and provincial colonialism without ever admitting they were doing it, not even to themselves. And I think that's a very important distinction too. Americans in the peak of its imperialist violence, never admitted in the United States that we were doing this kind of thing. It's still, it's, you're still considered radical or even a wacko to suggest that the U.S. exercised its power in a neo-colonial or neo-imperialist manner, which I don't know this history as well, I think was quite different in the era of high European colonialism, right? There was, there was a, not only a recognition that this is what we're doing as Europeans, but we have certain responsibilities because we're doing it's it. in the next chapter, which you haven't I guess, completely touched, which is the Middle East in the last, you know, in the last years. We clearly see that Russia has still a very important influence in countries like Syria or like uh, we see in Libya today. And, uh, and then there are the Turks and obviously the local people, right? And how is America working on that field? America's failing. And how much they rely on countries like Israel, how does it work? Are you studying that too, or that's another book, another story? It's a slightly different story. Yes, I am looking at that. That is something I am looking at very closely, the Arab Spring, the failure of the Iraq war, 
the failures of U.S. hegemony in, in the Middle East um, since 2003, I think. And I think the, the short way that I can answer your question now is that if you wanted to draw, you know, take a huge step back and draw what's the high point of U.S. hegemony, when does it really start to decline? I think probably 2003 is, is as good of a choice as any, because the invasion of Iraq was a catastrophic failure, not only from a human rights perspective, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, even from a cynical, self-interested perspective, it was a failure for the United States. The United States did not in any way increase its power in the Middle East or the world. It was an act of self-harm and of aggression against others. So this things have not gone the way that the United States foreign policy establishment would have liked them to in the last 17 years, not at all. And do you think that the new administration that seems to be coming with Biden, Joe Biden, is going to change something in the equilibrium of, of the world and in the American way of doing? Or, and you think that America will become somehow stronger again or you see an inevitable decline? I think as a result of Joe Biden, if I were to speculate, I would say my guess is that Biden slows down the rate of decline a bit. And I think that there will be a difference in style um, when it comes to foreign policy with Joe Biden. I don't think the, I think the overall goals of U.S. foreign policy didn't change very much with Donald Trump. What changed a lot was the style, the way that he would tear up agreements that had been made, antagonize allies antagonize parts of his own government that are very important. I think Joe Biden will try very hard to repair relations with the foreign policy establishment in Washington, D.C. and with allies. But one very important question after the Trump administration that a lot of countries, I think, are, are asking from Germany to Iran is, why do you make a deal with the United States if one of the two parties is likely to tear it up the next time they get back in the White House in, in four to eight years? And that is going to be a very difficult challenge for the United States to overcome in the attempts to maintain the kind of hegemony that had at the end of the 20th century. It's very difficult to lead the world if nobody trusts the, the deal they're making is going to last until the next party gets into power. And that's the Iranian case, for instance. Without in any way feigning sympathy for, for the hardliners in Iran, I think you could ask, well, why would you make a deal with the United States? You know, they made a deal with the United States under Obama, and then the next administration turns around and puts sanctions on the country during a pandemic, which are hugely harmful. They had been trying to do what they were asked to do. And this question can be asked again about even about NATO allies or allies in Latin America, allies that have a much less confrontational relationship with the United States. The U.S. political system seems to be dysfunctional in the kinds of ways that make the exercise of hegemony in the 20th century style very difficult. Thank you very much for this interview, Vincent. Sure. It was very interesting. Thank you very much for your interest. Alan L. Can interviews.